Hello and welcome to the first video for the first week of Calculus 3. In this video we're going to introduce the basic definitions of infinite series. We're going to spend the first couple of weeks talking about infinite series. It's expected that you've seen infinite series ready in Calculus 2, so we're going to go a bit more quickly through it than we did the first time and we'll get into a bit more depth at the end of week 2. But I do want to review the basic definitions. I'm going to start from scratch. Infinite series is the third branch of the calculus after integrals and derivatives. Like integrals and derivatives, we're trying to solve, in some sense, an infinite problem. And this infinite problem is how to add up infinitely many numbers and see what happens. Um, and for many centuries, it was considered impossible. Adding up infinitely many numbers doesn't make sense. But the definitions of calculus give us a way to say that, well, maybe it does make sense. Maybe infinitely many numbers added together can actually give us something reasonable. We approach this the same way we approach all, all the basic definitions of calculus. We do an approximation. Here's the approximation. Then we take a limit of the approximation process. The approximation in this case is called a partial sum. So this Sn is the nth partial sum of the series. Instead of going to infinity, it just goes to some spot n. So it is an ordinary finite sum. This is a thing that algebra can do. We can add up finitely many numbers. So we just sum up the first n terms of our series. And then we take the limit as the number of terms goes to infinity. There's the approximation, your limit of your approximation process. If that limit exists, we say that it's equal to the series. We say that the series converges. If that limit doesn't exist, we say the series diverges. So let me do some important classical examples. Uh, I'm going to deal with this one for a couple of slides. Let me put it up there on the left. Infinite series often gets introduced in the context of Zeno's paradox, and this is an old Greek paradox that says that if you have to travel a distance, well, first you have to travel half the distance. When you've traveled half the distance, you have half left, but you have to travel half of the remaining distance, and then you have to travel half the remaining distance, and then you have to travel half the remaining distance, and you have infinitely many of these halves. So any kind of travel involves infinitely many things. Doing infinitely many things is impossible. So therefore, why, why can we actually move? Movement should be impossible. And so what we have here is we have a half. Half of what's left is a quarter. And half of what's left is an eighth. Half of what's left is a sixteenth. So we're adding up fractions where the denominator is a power of two. So that gives us this sum. n equals one to infinity, one over two to the n. We get all these denominators which are powers of two. And I want to look at the partial sums to see if I can take the limit of a, the partial sums to argue that this does, in fact, converge to 1. This whole distance should be 1, because movement is, in fact, possible. First partial sum is just the first term is 1 half. Second partial sum, 1 half plus a quarter is 3 quarters. Third partial sum, we have the 3 quarters. Our next term is 1 eighth. 3 quarters plus an eighth is 7 eighths. Fourth partial sum, the first three terms gave us 7 eighths. Then we add a sixteenth. So we get 15 sixteenths, so that's as far as this point. Uh, the next partial sum, we add a 32nd, we get 31 over 32. And we can intuit, or if we want to be more formal, prove that there's actually a pattern of partial sums here. That each partial sum, um, Sn, has 2 to the n in the denominator. S5 has 2 to the 5, which is 32 in the denominator. And its numerator is going to be exactly one less than this. And all the partial sums will, in fact, have this pattern. So once we have a pattern for partial sums, we can take the limit. This is an asymptotic analysis limit. The minus 1 has no bearing asymptotically. We have 2 to the n and 2 to the n, so the limit should be 1. And we have, in fact, proved within the confines of the assumptions of calculus a solution to Zeno's paradox, that adding up all these halves is, in fact, a thing we can do. And what we get out of all of it is the finite number 1. It's not an infinite thing. It's a finite thing. So even though there are infinitely many little halves, they all add up to the finite number one. That's what we mean by the convergence of series. And this is an example of how to prove convergence by finding a pattern for the partial sums and taking the limit of that pattern as the number of terms n in the partial sum goes to infinity. So let me do a divergent example as well. And I want to put this one up as well, so I'll have it there for a few slides. The harmonic series is the series 1 over n. So this is all of the fractions 1 over a whole positive number, 1 plus a half plus a third plus a quarter plus a fifth plus a sixth, so forth and so on. I want to argue that this actually diverges, and I want to do this by giving you a lower bound for certain particular partial sums. The first partial sum is just 1. The first term is 1. The second partial 
sum S2 is one plus a half is three halves. And after this, I only wanna look at partial sums whose index is a power of two. So I'm gonna look at S4, S8, S16, so forth and so on. So the next one I wanna look at is S4. And I wanna replace this one quarter or one third with one quarter. One quarter is less than a third, so I no longer get equality, but S4 is greater than the sum I get where I replace that third with a quarter. But doing this lets me group these quarters together. So I get one plus a half, two quarters is also a half, so I get another half, so I get two. And I can keep doing this with powers of two. Uh, in this one plus a half plus a third up to an eighth, I'll replace the third with a quarter again. The next term is a quarter goes down there. And then these three terms here, a fifth plus a sixth plus a seventh, those are all larger than an eighth. So if I wanna keep S8 larger than something, I can replace all three of these terms with eighths. And then plus this eighth, I get exactly four eighths because there are four terms there. A fifth plus a sixth plus a seventh plus an eighth is larger than an eighth plus an eighth plus an eighth plus an eighth, plus an eighth which is four eighths. And what I've done then is I've got this, I've got a half, these two quarters added up to half, and this also adds up to a half. So I get an extra half when I do this. And this pattern is gonna continue for the 16th partial sum, the next eight terms, one ninth plus one tenth plus one eleventh plus one twelfth, so on. These are all larger than a sixteenth. So I'm gonna get eight sixteenths, I'm gonna get another half. So plus five halves, I'm gonna get another half, I'm gonna get six halves, which would be three. The next power of two, I'll get another half, so this is larger than seven halves. The next power of two, I'll get another half, this is larger than eight halves. And I see that if I have an even power of two, I get that it's larger than the next whole number. So that's the pattern I wanna make, is that if I have an even power of two, s to the two k minus two, this is in fact larger than the number k. And this is true for all k greater or equal to. So this says that certain partial sums are at least as large as the numbers k, but this is true for all k. So as k keeps going, the limit of these pieces, of these particular partial sums, is going to infinity, because they're bounded below by the numbers, and the numbers go to infinity. But the limit of the infinite series, since we're adding positive pieces, each time we get past one of these special 2 to the 2k minus 2 partial sums, we just keep adding more stuff. So it, it can't do anything but keep getting larger. So this limit has to be at least as large as this limit. And if this limit goes to infinity, then this limit also has to go to infinity. Infinity is not a number, so this limit does not exist. So the harmonic series does not converge. We say the harmonic series diverges. Let me mention notation for a moment here. Since the limit here was infinity, um, We'll often write this, the sum n equals one to infinity, one over n equals infinity. This is still divergent. Infinity is not a number. This is a shorthand for saying that this sum gets larger and larger without bound, gets larger than any finite number. We, we will write equals infinity as a shorthand for divergence. And often, particularly if the terms a n are all positive, less than infinity turns into a shorthand for convergent. Again, this is not an actual comparison with a number because infinity is not a number. This is a shorthand meaning that the series is a convergent series, at least when the terms a n are positive. The harmonic series also gives us one more thing to think about. The harmonic series has terms um, that go to zero. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the terms. So we are adding smaller and smaller pieces, but it still adds up to infinity. One of the things that students are always tempted to say is that, well, if the terms are getting smaller, the sum must be finite, and that's not true. However, the opposite is true, and this is called the test for divergence, and this, this is quite a useful thing to have access to, is that if I have an infinite series and the limit of the terms a n is not zero, then I get divergence. And that sort of makes sense, because if the things are not getting smaller and smaller, then I'm adding up things that are significantly large, and I'm adding up infinitely many of them, there's no way that can converge. So this is, this is one of the most useful things to know about series. We're gonna get into a bunch of divergence tests later, but this is sort of the first and most basic one, that if the terms a n do not converge to zero, the limit of the series must be divergent.